right. So uh, today we're here with Erica Hanrahan, who is another former student of mine, not from Central York. She's uh, graduated from East Stroudsburg High School uh, back in the 90s, mid 90s, right? 97. I have no fear of that's, my age. That, <laughs> that's right. She was actually a classmate of Michael's, who we, uh, we, we talked to Michael Drillette uh, the other day. Oh, so. yeah. And he wanted to say that he loved your work. Uh, what was it, Pal Joey? Pal, or, Pal uh, Joey, yes. Pal he Joey, yeah. On. yeah. He said, he said, and my, one of my sit, sit downs like crossed over, and we got to see each other perform. Oh. Yeah, really great. Okay, my dog's barking in the background. Uh, this is going to be good. All right, so um, let's just start. Can you start off maybe just by telling us a little bit about uh, what training you've had, uh, where you went to college, and kind of sure. how you how you got to the point where you are today? Sure. Okay, so um, I went to – I graduated from New York University to School of the Arts, but before that, for one year, um, for many reasons that – not necessary to go into, but I'm I'm happy to um, uh, cost of certain schools and certain programs um, and just some some live things. I went to an all women's college called Cedar Crest College in Allentown, Pennsylvania, before I went transferred into NYU, and actually it set me up really really well to um, to to be successful in a place like New York University. Um, I think if I had gone there first, I might have maybe been swallowed up a little bit or a little intimidated. It really helped. It gave me the year to figure out exactly what I wanted to, um, as far as a performing arts, uh, exactly where, what I wanted to focus on and where I wanted to focus. And uh, it really set me up to be successful. So then I went on to New York University. Um, and I actually, because of doing the first year at Cedar Crest, I graduated a semester early out of New York University. Um, I went in, in Tisch. There were at the time, I think it's a little different now, there were seven schools for undergraduate study. Uh, you had to do uh, two years at a primary studio. Um, and I chose to work at Strasbourg. Um, because they also had a focus on, I didn't, I was very musical and I do a lot of musical theater, but I didn't want that to be my focus. I wanted my like core to be the acting. I could take private, uh, pr uh private dance and private, uh, vocal training myself. So I studied at Strasbourg for two years and then, uh, I went on to their, um, Stone Street Studios, which at the time, though, I don't, I don't know if it exists anymore, uh, was their, uh, school for television and film and got a little bit of training under my belt in that regard, though, I will say things changed so drastically by the time I graduated. Um, and I think this is true for a lot of people my age and what happened uh, in the, the digital age was just starting to happen uh, as far as television and film is concerned. So some of the study I got for television film was basic and good for me, but it changed almost immediately upon, the, upon me graduating. <laughs> so I was a little null and void at that point. But, um, and then let's see, I, I got out of school and I want, I, Again, my training was in acting, um, but I always took private dance. I always took private voice. And once I started auditioning, I could book musicals very, very quickly. Um, and I, I did, and that's what I started working on the most as far as regional theater is concerned. I started really doing a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, uh, I, like a special, spe almost like um, what I like to call the dark sickles. <laughs> so I'm not like a, gr I'm a good dancer. I'm a good mover, but I started doing a lot of candor and ebb. I did cabaret over and over and over again. I did Jesus Christ Superstar over and over and over again. Some of that has to do with my vocal quality, but some of that, and I could just book work. And I ended up getting my equity card maybe almost a year out of school, uh, out of college, because I worked fairly consistently regionally. And so then I just Board around, lived in New York, and and worked regionally. And um, after, let's see, uh, maybe six, seven years of doing that, I decided to make the move to Los Angeles because I still really wanted to do more television and film. Um, 
especially on the comedy side of things. They really wanted to do some of that and uh, and and have and I've lived here for almost 14 years now. It's gone, gone by like that. <laughs> so yeah. Great. Um, you you kind of addressed this. Uh, do do you still do you still study acting, dancing, mm-hmm. singing? Do you still study yeah. privately? Yep, I am that person, and I firmly believe this. I know everyone has their own way of doing things. I don't. I'm not a person that really likes to rest on her laurels. So, um, and you know, musicians have to, and dancers have to do their thing every day. And it's hard as an actor, and even as a singer. I, mean, I can get up and sing in my apartment every day, but um, you know, to to be an actor, to be in front of an audience, to be with a partner, um, I take class as much as I can as often as I can so and I I I volley between audition on camera audition technique classes um uh, at Actors Comedy Studio or um just because you also getting in front of a camera constantly is important um to I study with a vocal coach I study with Rachel Lawrence Douglas and I've studied with her for almost 13 years now um even now in quarantine we do we do this if I'm working on something we, we do it this way um, she is my go-to person, and um, I owe a large amount of the of of the shows that I book. I, I mean, it's me, but it's also like the work that she has helped me with, the way she has helped me develop my voice, the way she has helped me develop my um, audition uh, book. All of that is is a, a, in a large part to her. Um, I don't dance so much anymore though occasionally because that's not my thing but I always make sure that I'm doing something so I take yoga almost every single day now I'm doing it in my apartment (laughs) after quarantine but I make sure that like um body work is just as important even though I'm not a dancer uh vocal work is just as important you know whether you're a singer or not um and being in class and so like I said I'll do on camera audition technique and then I'll I'll stop that for a while and I'll go take a Shakespeare intensive because I haven't done a Shakespeare show in a while. And then I'll go and do a, a you know, a, a, another theater thing for a while. I don't always get to do class. If I'm working a lot, it's hard to be able to take class, but if I'm not working, I'm in class. Always. So um, I'm, I, I think uh, I followed your career uh, via uh Facebook a lot, and and it seems like you you book a lot of gigs and do a lot of d- do. D- you do a lot, which means you must audition a lot. Can you talk about uh, oh, yeah. like how often do you audition, and what advice do, do you have? Any advice that you could give the kids about auditioning and how to prepare for that? Yeah, I do. Um, it's different dependent on um, the type of work you're doing. I audition constantly. Now, I also started about maybe two years ago, three years ago, bouncing back and forth between here and New York because my agency is also in New York. And so, and my family's still there. So it's, it's easy for me. It's not easy for everybody, but between LA and New York. So, um, and in the past 10 years too, it used to be if you had to go on tape for something, fine, but they didn't really like it, especially now, especially with what's going on. Tapes are, that's a whole separate thing. We could talk about that later, but um, I'm constantly auditioning, even in quarantine. I think I've had to self-tape for at least twice a week for something. Um, Mm. And so I'm never not auditioning. I love, I don't love self-tapes, but I love being in the room and um, I audition at the at the height of every season between television and film and theater, I will say I have and commercials. I would say I have probably four or five auditions a week, and then if you add callbacks in from the following week, so it's constant. Um, and I, I don't know. I might be a weird case. I love auditioning because as long as I'm auditioning, I know there's a possibility of working. If I'm not auditioning. There's, unless somebody's going to straight off for me, which just happens, but it doesn't happen that often. Um, it, there's, no, there's no possibility of working. And, you know, you usually book, especially theatrically speaking, uh, a little less television and film, but you book out, you book a job for the next few months. So if you're not auditioning, that means it's a couple months of not working. And that, that hurts. Um, I love being in the room and my philosophy in auditioning and made two things. 
I don't want to get ahead of myself. I have a lot to say about fishing. <laughs> I, am, I, I have a lot of opinions about it. Um, I A lot of people don't like it. I know they're two separate skills. Performing and auditioning are two very separate skills. And until you start doing it a lot, you can't really hone it. Some people are naturally good at it. And some people have to hone that skill. Um, and it's, I've never been in a room, everyone in the room wants you to succeed. It really doesn't feel good for anybody behind the table if somebody's not succeeding. So my philosophy in auditioning is the super objective is to book the job. We all want to book the job, but that's not my goal. My goal when I go into an audition is to make a fan or to make fans. Um, Because... I can't control who they cast. I can control my preparation. I can control how consistent I am. I can control what I'm wearing. I can control, you know, those are the things that I can control and I can control whether or not I walk out of there feeling like I made a fan. Um, And the more fans you have, the more consistently you're going to audition and to start. And that's it. My job is to win the room and to make fans. The booking will come. It yeah, that's that's fantastic that you say that. I always say to them, uh, you know, you have these, you know, you have a legal pad of yeah. notes. And if you're going into even a room for the musical, even in high school, and you're trying to nail that one part, instead, focus on getting a star next to your name or yeah. get, get an underline. You may not yeah. get the part, but if you get a, a star or a little yeah. underline or a circle... That's right. making a fan. That's one way of putting it. We say, like, yeah. re- be re- be memorable to the point yeah. where you may not get that part, but we'll find a place for you because you were that good. Yeah, And we'll or remember we'll, you next time you come through. Yeah, they'll find a place for you or they'll keep calling you out. And the more <laughs> consistent you are, and be, that's a big part of it too, being the things you can control, your preparation and your consistency. And if you're coming in every single day with a, every single time with a good attitude, you're incredibly prepared. You're down to try things. You are, you, that's just winning the room. And there it's because what happens is so you do the audition, you do that, and then you get called back. So when you get called back, then it's the casting director and then producers. Usually if you're, not prepared if you are not on top of your game if you are have a bad attitude any of those things um the casting director is embarrassed they they they're put they're you know they're like look i found this gem and like she's so wonderful and then if you come in so your job is just to come in be consistent be prepared have a good attitude have fun um, of course there are nerves that's not, and, and the, the thing about nerves is that you just have to, the more you audition, the more you learn where, where to place them. That's all like they're there. They're going to be there. I still get nervous for certain things. Some things, yes, some things, no, but you just start to learn. But the more you get called in because you're do, you're doing all those jobs, you're making fans the more you're going to learn the skill of auditioning. Yeah. And and I think another thing about that too, that's fantastic uh, for that. I want to drive home to everybody watching as well is, is that yes, you like auditioning, but I think you've also realized that each audition is in, in many respects, that could be one of the only times, or in your case, four times you're performing every week, right? If you're doing other work, take audition the paradigm shift is taking the audition from this scary thing and what about looking at it as an opportunity to go in and and perform this amazing piece whether it is something or not mini it's a mini performance it's a mini performance and um you know especially with musicals too like you know there's so many other things that are involved you got the accompanist you you know like those are again it's it's just really the more you can take if you are somebody who's super nervous and look I have friends who don't aren't in the business anymore not because they weren't wonderful it's because they never really got a hold of the skill of auditioning they just could not do that part of it and what role do you think rejection played in that do you feel that came up with michael a little bit we talked a little bit about that because both of you seem to have uh really this strong drive and this strong sense of uh get stick to itiveness and like 
you know, like I love what you said earlier about like you also have to after the audition, you have to be able to learn the skill of not being hard or thick skinned or callous enough that like to let it go and be done with it and not take anything personally because you'll it'll eat you up but i I, michael mentioned that too do you feel that rejection it was as as, as a part of that it's tough to deal with that consistency of rejection um i feel like honestly no one (laughs) no one can reject me harder than i can reject me and i can be pretty hard on myself so there's no the the best way I've learned to deal with rejection. I don't take anything personally, uh, and that's also just a life thing. I just don't. People are concerned with their own, more concerned with themselves and their own thing than they are with me. I don't. There have definitely been auditions that I have bombed that have not. You know, just it happens. Um, I don't take. I never think. I never personally feel that like if I don't book something and some jobs hurt worse than others, some jobs you just, you know, you've really got to, some rejection hurts worse than others. I just have never felt, I have personally never felt like this business has been rejecting me or I'm not booking a job doesn't feel like reject. It feels like a no for right now. Um, that's all it's ever felt like. And all I've ever tried to do, and some of that helps being in class all the time or being with a coach all the time, because then you can game plan it. Then you can turn around and, or an agent or whatever. You can be like, I didn't have as great of an audition this time as I wanted to. What are the things that I can control to make sure that doesn't happen again? Maybe this wasn't the right material for me. Maybe Mm -hmm. I didn't approach it correctly. So we're either going to circle back and work on it again, or we're going to decide that wasn't the right role for me. It should have been this, or this isn't my show. But I've never really felt personal. I've never felt that the rejection was personal. Uh, Mm -hmm. I've been very lucky. Some of that might have to do with some of the shows that I typically do. I'm really specific vocally and my, my look and my type um, so that I'm very rarely, especially at this point in my career, maybe earlier on, I'm really rarely going in for something that I'm not right for. So I'm usually at least in the mix for it. So if I don't get it, as long as I know I had a good audition, and at this point, I'm a good enough auditioner. I know when I had a good audition. I know when I didn't have a good audition. <laughs> yeah, and if you're getting called back consistently, that's yeah. another thing to remember. If you yeah. get into the room by itself through, if, if you get a hedge, they you've already passed the first the win. Mm-hmm. You've already you've already succeeded, and that's something. It's a mind shift culture yeah. set to get some people to understand that, like, you're in the audition already. And if you get called back, you've already, in many respects, like you said, won already a little bit. That's my, that's actually, outside of making fans, getting the call back, if it's something I know I'm right for, is my only job. I cannot, I can, I have no, no control, no say. As long as I know I did, that means I did my work. And all I care about is doing my work. So as long as I did my work, I said the rest of it is not, it has nothing to do with me. Um, if, if on occasion, and I can think of a few occasions where I didn't get called back for something that I thought I did a really good job on, that's where it doesn't always work this way, but if you have an agent, you can have them check in just to make sure, but it's not to be whiny and it's not to be like, why didn't she get a thing? It's just like, was there something that was off was just because she didn't feel that way you can have them feedback yeah Yeah. i try not to do that too much because my agent relies on me to to know and to be able to Mm -hmm. brush it off to let it go um but if occasionally there's one that i thought um i really walked out of there feeling like i should have been in the mix for the callback can i can you just check in and make sure there was nothing off Usually there's not. Usually if the director had somebody in mind already and those two people came in and that was it. Great. So out of, since you do audition a lot, what do you think, what's the percentage of the jobs that you get offered based on how many? That's really, really hard. I I would have to separate television and film and commercials are like a lottery. Like it's literally, it's just a numbers game and you just keep going. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, that's like, I couldn't even, I can't even put that in there. Those, those aren't my favorite actually, but, um, 
I'll just talk about theater because that's an easier way for, again, at this point, I am, I am going in for things that I, I know that I'm right for. Um, audition wise, let's see, uh, let's say, oh, that is such a good question. I at least Sorry. get called back for probably eight out of 10. And, um, I would say I book probably uh, out of 10, I, I, at least half, at, if not a little more than half, wow. six out of 10. Um, the thing is, is that once you get a job, you can't audition for other jobs. Because right. You're doing right. And that's, those are over, that would be in theater. That would be over a, uh, what, a couple months run. Right. Oh, and yeah. then yeah. Right. The yeah. Next. So, so that's, out of you're the, talking, you're talking like 18 months to do at least 10 jobs or 10 auditions. I probably did six over that amount of time because each one's between two and three months long. But it also sounds, it also sounds like your experience helps keep that number where it is because Absolutely. you know what jobs are good for you. So yeah. you don't just take everything. You don't that's go for everything you can find. You go for the ones that you really think fit. No, that's also a really big part. And it's easier as you get older. It's a lot harder uh, when you're first starting out, especially because the industry is so youth, uh, especially right now, if we're talking theater and musical theater, it's very uh, youth centric. Um, uh, you know what I mean? You've got, especially if you just look at what's happening on Broadway and eventually that trickles down into regional um, you just a lot of things, Dear Evan Hansen, Heather's, like if you start looking at all of those, those, um, it definitely is, is a little more youth centric. And so I would not have worked as consistently if I were young now, I absolutely, uh, would, I, I came up in a time of a little more, um, contemporary musical theater, not, not modern musical theater, or I'm sorry, modern musical theater, not contemporary musical theater. Um, I don't know if I would have worked, worked now, uh, as much as I did then. So it, it, it took me a long time to realize what I'm right for, um, how I come across on stage and that's class too. That's consistently being in class. That's, that's, um, and making sure that you're, you're working things out for yourself. You don't want to wait until an audition to work things out for yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, do you have any, Ben, do you have anything else you want about no, auditioning? I, I that was that, really good, good yeah, stuff. Fantastic. There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I so, just love it. If you learn to love auditioning, it will learn to love you. That doesn't mean <laughs> every audition is going to be the best thing of your life. Sometimes you just knock them out and you're just like, ah, they were, they were the, no, but you're, you're, you're exactly right too. You're not going, I say all the time, you're not going to get better at anything. I don't, I don't understand the stigma around certain, I think acting kind of gets a, a weird rap where I see a lot of people will pay for vocal coaching and dance classes. But when it comes to like private acting classes or things of that nature, it's tough for people to jump on those because they I, acting gets a bum rap. And I think yeah. in some cases, and I love how you said earlier, way back at the beginning about how like you, you knew that, you know, you needed an also a, an acting core because yeah. I don't, I don't want to say that, but like everybody, not everybody, but people, everybody in New York, a lot of people in New York can sing and dance, right. Yep. Especially if they want to do no, musical almost theater. Almost everybody. There's actually some casting directors who will be, who will sit down. If you're doing a casting director workshop, they will be like, everyone can sing. Everyone can sing. You're not <laughs> professional because you can sing. Everyone can do it. And that's yeah. everyone that's you know, for the yeah. for, for the most in varying degrees, but for the most part it's true. Yeah. You know. So yeah, I'm not the best uh, singer in the world. I just I just have tailored my voice to my acting abilities. That's funny because Michael said just about the same thing about yeah. acting. That it was yeah. it was it was his ability to act. That, yeah. that got him the roles he got, not his ability to sing and dance. So. My ability to act, my ability to understand verse, my ability to um, also accents and dialects. I work a lot on us and only because the, theatrically speaking, I feel like at this point, half of the roles I do are a lot of British, a lot of Cockney, a lot of um, 
I, I, right before the shutdown, I booked, um, I've already done Sweeney Todd once last year, but I booked uh, another Sweeney Todd playing Love It. And then I just before that had done um, Matilda, the mom and Matilda. So I'm just doing a lot of that and be able to like, there's no time anymore. Rehearsals are down to two weeks. So there's no time to learn that stuff. So that's where classes have to come in. You have to be ready to go. You can't, yep. and it's the, you're right. Um, it's, it's, it's my ability to act and my act, act my way through a song, even if somebody else can technically sing it better than I can. That's boring. Uh, yeah, and that's where the yeah. that's where the tech that's where the text analysis and the the scene scene study and yeah. the audition work comes in, at least yeah. in the experience that I've seen, and and that's that's just right on. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's anything that we can do to to keep encouraging to help build. We had that question about triple threat. Like we we talk a lot about that building a, a solid performer from mm -hmm. three different standpoints. You know, being right. able to act, sing, and dance. Um, and understand material and all that stuff so that we're fusing those three together. I, I feel that they, a lot of those things, especially in, in schools, at least public schools, a lot of in secondary education, they get separated, you know, and they shouldn't, they shouldn't be really separated. There should be some continuity amongst those, but. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let's, um, let's talk about, uh, maybe the difference between theater and TV? You say you, you actually yeah. prefer to do TV. Why is, why, why no, do you prefer? No, I actually, I prefer to do, I prefer to do theater. That is my okay. first and truest love. But uh, when I got here and ex walked on a set for the first time and How I Met Your Mother was the first set. I worked on that show for, for many seasons. Um, when I walked on that set for the first time, I realized that a multicam and I know it gets a bad rap sometimes, but a multicam um, sitcom set is a proscenium stage. Uh, uh, How I Met Your Mother did not shoot in front of a studio audience for specific reasons, but most of them do. And so it is not that far removed from theater. And that's why it was a natural fit for me. And I've done single cam uh, and single cam comedy, but uh, I, I will say... Um, for me, that, that was the most natural fit. Uh, theater is my first love, but I really do, uh, love moving that into a, um, uh, 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 being able to use those skills on a multicam sitcom because it really is a proscenium that you'll, you'll walk on and you'll be like, oh, I get it. It's a stage. That's why it's called soundstage. I didn't know. I, you know, <laughs> um, uh, and I, it, it really just dawned on me that like, and then you have an audience there and you have cameras that are just angled on the, basically on the stage and that, that's it. Um, so I love it. I, I, that, and that's the, the difference is, the biggest difference is the, the difference in auditioning, to be quite honest. Um, it's a different, it's a different type of, it's a smaller, um, uh, more, you, there's a little more room uh, for role interpretation in theater than there is uh, mm. for television film. And the first, when you first start doing television and film auditions, you would you'll you'll start doing um, really small one lines, two lines, three lines, co what they call co-stars. Um, what they're looking for at that point is not. They just want you to say the lines with the correct punctuation. With and they want you to just make a make a make a a choice, but it's not a big one, you know. It's and in theaters quite different. There's a lot more latitude uh, to uh, interpret things and to make them their, your own and to make them a little bit bigger. Um, that would be the biggest the biggest thing I would say is um, the technique in in auditioning. Those are the two the biggest differences. What's been your favorite? Um, you mentioned how I met your mother. What are some other uh, enjoyable roles or um, TV sets or, or single cam or work that you've done? Like, what are some, some of your favorite things to, the, to look back I would on? Say the, the most notable um, is when I get to sing on camera, and I've done that quite a few times. So The Office, uh, Sweeney Todd. There's so much Sweeney Todd in my life. <laughs> uh, the Office, Sweeney Todd was, I mean, because we work for a week on the show, we did, what you see on the show is this much, but we actually filmed almost three quarters of the entire show of Sweeney Todd on that stage. Uh, and that was just 
incredible. Anytime I get to take my theater and bring it on to, and I did a, an episode of uh, Alexa and Katie and I got to sing, um, all these things get filmed big and then you see this much of it, but <laughs> it's the experience of getting to take what I know about theater and bring it to uh, television film that I, I really, really love. So those, those so- are what yeah, I have a follow up that I get a question a lot from the the students, um, and it's you know chatting with work. This is the best part of this whole situation. One of the bright silver linings in this yeah. whole quarantine has been these conversations that have come out of you know yeah. building a curriculum and and helping keeping our kids active and and the learning. So um, so glad you're doing this. And one of the questions I get constantly is, you know, I think there's some skepticism and some real confusion about like pay for or like like making a living by doing either theater or tv and i talk about like you could book a commercial and you know that could cover your couple months you know so i can you talk a little bit about like you know i don't want to say financial life but like how that pay like how you go about manage you do any side jobs or like other things like i think there's some questions a lot about that kind of thing like how do you make a living doing that yeah that is a very good question <laughs> uh, I have done every side job from the beginning of this from the beginning of getting out of co- even in college from the beginning of college to um to to now I actually have one of the best side jobs although currently no job because quarantine. Um, I actually have a side job in production on television because I love multicam so much. So that's one of my jobs. It started out as stand-in work, um, which is a great, you know, that goes into your pension and health. So it's a great, and it's very flexible. But then uh, I got well-known enough that um, basically what I do is uh, on d- depending on what show I'm working on for multicam shows specifically, when an actor can't be there, I will do their table reads for them. I will do the rehearsals for them. Um, so they don't have to lose a day of work. Um, and all of that, like I said, all, all, I'm sag after so and equity. So that goes in, that's a side job that I have that is flexible. Um, if I have to leave and go do a, you know, a, a show for two months, then I, I leave that show. Sometimes, I don't get to go back to it, but sometimes I do. Uh, every all the assistant directors I work with, all the AD that I work with, know that I'm an actor first. That's why they use me for this job. It's not really a, a job that has a title. I'm just very lucky that I get to do it. But that's a side job that goes into my pension and health. I no longer wait tables. I no longer bartend. I no longer nanny. But I did all of those things forever. Um, I never minded doing them mostly because I'm one of those people that never wanted to put all of my um, eggs in one basket. And those skills have taught me more and helped me more uh, be a well-rounded actor. Being a really good waitress helped me get how I met your mother because they needed somebody who could realistically wait tables um, who looked like she belonged in a, an Irish pub in New York. So, uh, but they, that's what they, they needed some. And so all of the things that I had working with kids, um, has helped me, um, nannying, bartending, all of that stuff. Those are, it can be exhausting to have so many jobs and to be juggling constantly. Um, but, None of the jobs I had, I, I was, I've always been able to make a living um, because they all are just different little skills and different little things. Another thing that a lot of people overlook, you know, I talk about going to class all the time. Well, that's really expensive. If you live in New York or LA or Chicago or any, you know, wherever, if you're taking class all the time, that can be overwhelmingly expensive and one thing I've always done as best as I can I've done it for voice teachers I've done it for vocal coaches I've done it for my on-camera audition technique classes it's trying to do you don't always get to do it right away but if you've gotten into a studio for a while and you want to continue to take class ask them if you can do something for trade ask them if you could file things do computer work for them clean I've cleaned studios I've I've done that stuff um, I still 
still do that at my yoga studio when yoga studios were, <laughs> you know, only because I take so much. And so often I clean the studio for free, uh, free stuff. So there's, there's always a way that you can make this work. And, um, I think there are also things that you can do that aren't waiting tables. If that's not your bag, I was just really good at it. Um, I have friends who do real estate on the side who also really, there's like a lot of things you can do. Um, my friends who teach, I have friends, you know, who, um, uh, especially do teach instruments. Um, that's another thing. When you talk about triple threat, I always say quadruple threat. Cause if you can yeah. like, so pick up fledgling guitar, I played our accordion in a show and I still take, class occasionally doing that because I fell in love with it I'm terrible at it but (laughs) but if you can pick those things up those are also just going to help you continue to work um and and that's important because a lot of shows have started to want those things because a it helps production it helps them save money so if we you have you know you do Hades Town, or you know all of those shows. Uh, I could just I could list a bunch of shows where people are uh, the actors are on stage playing instruments. And and if you can learn some of those, if you could just I've learned accordion parts, and I'm a terrible accordion player. <laughs> uh, for I just ask people to send me scores, and I slowly learned the scores. So now I have tape of me doing them, and then I you can just how how many how many casting directors are getting tape. To, 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 you know, to, I digress, but like to, to, you know, oh, she already knows the accordion part to the show. Great. Hire her. Um, but I digress. I, you were talking about making a living. So I've done all the side jobs and slowly over time, I found this one where it goes into my pension and health. It is, it keeps me, it keeps me afloat in between jobs. Um, but I, that is a big part of it. Um, finding the things that you can do to help you maintain an artistic career. That is this, not just if that is, if you're a dancer, that is, if you're a musician, that is, if you are a painter, a writer, it's just, you know, the state of the arts in this country. And, and who knows, maybe some of this will, will, will force a little bit of a change, but, um, I don't, I don't think you always have to do the cliche job of waiting tables and bartending. I, like I said, I just happened to be good at it and um, it was easy for me to, to be able to do. Um, there are just so, there are so many things. I think if you think outside the box, you can find things that um, are as fulfilling for you um, that are also flexible that help you do. But I, I, I cannot stress enough and that just fits in there always try to see if there's a possibility of doing something for trade uh, as opposed to not taking class, as opposed to feeling like you can't afford it. Um, uh, I've gotten so much out of that. And that helps you also become a part of your community. Um, You know, uh, if you're doing, I'm filing things for a teacher, then you're meeting so many more people in the business who are, you know, things like that. And, and that's been really, really helpful. That's, that's a, that's a good advice. That's really good advice, actually. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it, I'm I, not going to, I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture that right. it is, it is, it is hard. It is, right. but I, I do think there are, especially right now with um, how, how, digital things are they were a little less so when I was was coming up um if you can find there are just there are probably more things than even I can come up with that are are not going to feel so oh I got to go to my bartending gig right now wow. bartend if you want to I have lots of friends to do it but um or uh, I got to go to my my you know job at the gap or what, whatever there, there are more things that I think that if you can think outside the box, you're going to be right. And you're just picking up life skills really. Yeah. Yeah. But it's um, hard. <laughs> yeah. And we don't, we don't sugarcoat things out here either. I think. And, and it's really important to validate that for everybody that like, listen, this is hard, but like I always push back to some parents that, that are saying, you know, really talented kids. Well, so is being a, becoming a lawyer. Uh, so is becoming a pharmacy rep at CVS. You know, somebody yeah. who's. I mean, it, it's just as. I mean, I'm. I'm going to assume you've been in LA for 14 years. It. I mean, uh, the average 
for me, from what I know and what I've looked, it's like seven. It's like you got to commit five to at least ten years. Oh of, yeah, of of pounding that pavement or more until you're yeah. going to start being able to go like, oh, I have a community. I have yeah. which when you do the math, five to ten years. That's that's pretty much what a lawyer's doing and a doctor's doing yeah. and even an educator getting their masters. Yep. It's I, I don't know why acting and performing gets that weird rap about like, yeah. yes, it's hard, but it's no less diff- why do something you don't like when you could go do something you love yeah. and put at the same I, time I, and effort. I knew I knew very early on uh, what I wanted to do. I've known for a very long time and I knew that it was going to be difficult and I I, I would not change a thing. Like I just what even in the darkest times and the times where you're not sure you're going to pay your rent, like, okay, but I got to do this show. And, but I think, I think you knew that you wouldn't be happy doing anything else. Like yeah, you wouldn't be happy if you weren't doing it. And I think that's sometimes the mistake that, that, that young people make nowadays is they worry so much about that bottom line. How am I going to make a living? Yeah not, am I going to be happy? And I don't know how many times I've told, I've told students who wanted to go into music and wanted to go and performing. Did you have to ask yourself, would, are you going to be happy if you're not doing it? Yeah. If the answer is no, I'm not, then you really don't have a choice. You can always find a way to make a living. You're a smart person. You're intelligent. You're resourceful. You can find a way to make a living. You're not going to be homeless, but if you're not happy doing what you're doing, then really What's the point? I, I've yeah. never seen the point of spending 40 years doing something that makes you absolutely miserable to have two weeks vacation. And I don't care. <laughs> I never a- absolutely. Have. Absolutely. And I think, I think in the arts, uh, you know, we can relate to that a lot more yeah. than, than a lot I, of people, but uh, yeah. Um, where do you want to go from here, Mr. Hodge? How about, uh, well, I was interested. I was interested. I think you were transitioning into like you talked about community and mm-hmm. finding communities yeah. and connecting and that uh, question yeah. about how much of the job is being able to work and get along with others um, oh. and talking a little bit about that follow up question of uh, do you find people in the talk a little bit about people you've met in the business. There's a lot of stigma about like, oh, I, you know, like they're everybody's cutthroat and, you know, all these producers and casting directors are and there I'm sure there are some but like. What's been there your experience are, with? Oh, there are definitely some. I have not. I have not experienced that at all. Like I just don't. Um, uh, and a, I, you know, I, I, I do think. Let's see. Um, before I was talking about um, uh, making fans. Um, what what that means also is being the type of person you want to be around. Um, because when you do this job, you are spending hours upon hours upon hours and no one wants to spend hours upon hours upon hours with somebody who is intolerable, um, or mean or a diva or any of that. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I have not personally, cause no one has time for it. Um, uh, and if you start to get a reputation for being that you, you might book some work, but you're not going to book as much work because it's just not, it's not enjoyable. I'd rather be around. And I think casting directors would agree with me. I'd rather be around somebody who is maybe not as good in the role, but is just a joy to be around than someone who is intolerable, but is phenomenal. Um, Yeah. It's just doesn't, it it does. It's not helpful to anybody and it doesn't ultimately lift the material up. Um, yeah, so that's that. I hope that, that I have not, I have truly, truly, I have to say very rarely in my, you know, it's usually in the audition process because people's nerves are giving them anxiety and maybe people don't come up across the best, but I really, truly do not believe, um, that I have been around somebody who's just a nightmare. I, I, I you know. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, I, I, you know, in my study, when I go out to LA um, summers and I'm working at, uh, and, and in, in, when I go wow. in New York, my journey's in there too. Like the working actors I'm meeting and the producers and the casting wow. directors I'm meeting and the teachers wow. I'm meeting, they couldn't be further from that. Yeah. They, they are so, everybody, it, and not, I mean, yeah, okay, there's some, it's not even fake to me. They're really, they're, they're, a lot of them are just genuinely, 
yeah. loving and care. They really love the craft when you find that right community. Yeah. And it's really important to, when you find that core community to like stay in it and, and yeah. find and be, I love what you said, get, be smart, ask to help. How can you yeah. help? How can you fit in? Okay. And that's really important. And, and, and when you first move to a place where they move to New York or Los Angeles or like, again, Chicago doesn't really matter many other places in the country that you could, could work, you know, and I have friends all over the country who are doing this business. It's not, doesn't just have to be those three cities. I'm just yeah, big naming. markets, any, any big market. But, um, but there are amazing small theaters and people who are doing small television and film who are like grassroots who are, that's where immediately you're going to find your people and you can start writing things and creating content. And I, I mean, I work consistently, but I have to tell you, I'm still members. Uh, I'm still a member of a bunch of small theater companies in Los Angeles. And honestly, right now with what's going on, and I had a, a, a conference with my agent the other day, but that's where theater is going to start back up again when all of this is over, because we're not going to be able to congregate and have audiences of thousands. So these small theater companies that I've been a part of, um, Sacred Fools Theater Company and Teus Theater Company, um, that I've been a, a company member at, like that's kind of a noise within. That's where the, the theater is going to come back. And I'm so, I've never been more grateful to be a part of uh, those small theater companies. And that's, that's where you get your community. That's where you, you are going to start working first. That's where you are going to, um, uh, build up your reputation. That's where you're going to keep your skills sharp. And, and yeah, I've not had an issue with anyone being a diva or being a nightmare or if, if anything, it, like I said, it comes maybe a little in the audition area because people are like stressed, but Any, anything else that uh, I, we hit everything on our list there? Um, so my question that I always like to ask people, my last question is always my same one, is if you could go back and uh, tell yourself uh, or talk to your high school self, uh, what would be one what would be one thing you'd go back and wish you could like not waste any time that you did in high school thinking about? Um, Especially I, performing. I, I, from a yeah, performance I, standpoint, I would I would answer two of those things. Um, t- two of those things would be um, don't feel like you're so far behind. There was something about some of the ways that I grew up that I, I felt for some reason I didn't go to performing arts camp. I didn't go. You know what I mean? I didn't have some of the things. I didn't play an instrument. I didn't. Um, don't feel for some reason at 18. There's all this pressure to feel like you're so far behind. And I don't know why I had that. And um, you're not. You want to play an instrument? Go play an instrument. You want to. You're not behind anything. You're 18 years old, so it's okay. <laughs> I would tell myself that. Um, and some of the the issues that I think you know, and this is a, a larger a larger subject. It's getting better, and I'm so glad it's getting better. But it was a little different uh, when I went to college. Um, uh, don't worry about uh, your your weight. Um, there was a lot of pressure, especially as a female on, uh, the way you look or my weight and to just, um, not that I, 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 and, and I've never, I I can't believe that I ever had, I had to deal with that, but I had to deal with it quite a bit. And, um, it Mm -hmm. seems so, it seemed like such an incredible waste of time. I played the roles that I played, no matter what I weighed. I sang the things I wanted to sing, no matter what I weighed. And, um, uh, taking care of your, your instrument, if, especially if you, you, a drummer can play when he's sick, a uh, bass player can play when he's sick. Um, if you're, if, if your, your body is not, uh, well, um, it's very difficult to get the best output of your art, uh, whether it's vocally, whether it's acting, whether it's dance, doesn't matter. Um, and so just taking care of yourself, the best you that you could possibly do, um, and not worry about so much what, what the rest of it is. And the, it, it's, again, it's getting better. It's, there's so much less, there's so much more acceptance than less talk of and less pressure. But w- when I was coming up, I would have said like, it didn't matter. And it felt like a giant waste of time to care so much about those things. Mm. And I'm, I'm glad it's getting better. And I hope for, 
um, kids coming up now, it's uh, the, that pressure is a little bit off because it was it's ugly and I don't like it. So I hope I hope those are the two things, but oh, not yeah, great. not feeling not feeling like you're so far behind at 18 years old. Like yeah. I don't know. Why? That yeah, well, I think society today forces that on kids. You know, you, if you yeah. if you if you haven't started baseball by second grade, you know, full time year round, you're yeah. never going to be a baseball player. That, that's yeah. that's the way we bring up kids nowadays. So, and I think that is good advice because, you know, when you're 18, you've got a long you've got a lot to learn and a long way to go. Oh you baby. can't expect yourself to be there yet. So, yeah. 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 Well, thank you for shedding that being so honest in all these, in this interview, it's been fantastic. And, um, I also, you know, also just, it's encouraging. I hope people that watch that and hear those responses specifically, uh, that there's also a lot of hope with what you said that like, there is, there is, um, there is a better, there's a better way and a better ending to all of our stories, even when we're in our darkest times that, um, it feels like it's the end, but in so many ways, especially for us as young people or as younger, when they're younger, it, that there, there is hope at the end and there is a, there is a better future. Um, yeah. and so thanks for, for letting us, rem, you know, reminding us of that. It's a really important thing that's valuable to people, especially young kids to hear. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and if, if any of them have any follow-up questions, they can email me or you can email you and email me. I'm, I'm happy to record a thing and answer any questions that anyone has. I hope I didn't gloss over anything or, or you know, I, I know I, I, I'm a very talky person, so sometimes I just, I'll wait and <laughs> so if I missed anything or, or somebody's question didn't get answered or there's any, any follow-up questions that they have, I please just feel free to send it my way and I'll record a video and send it to you guys or however you want to do it. I'm happy to. I'm happy to. Okay. Well, great. Thank you, Erica. It's been great catching up with you. Thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy and, and uh, just good luck. Good luck. There. Okay.